Welcome to the Two Stewards Show. Pretty much any time Mark gets in front of a microphone, it is a free-for-all, and this episode is no exception. On a serious note, how do the authorities of our day manage employment and inflation? Hello again, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Two Stewards Show. So we just finished a uh, book review in the last few episodes, and we're going to take a little bit of a break and just have a look at uh, some current events and... Um, I don't know what we would call this a market update or, or something, but just some thoughts that uh, have been uh, that we've been ruminating on, and the economy, house prices, inflation, everything seems to be getting more press. At least I'm reading more about it. I think it's more in would you say like the national consciousness, Brent? <laughs> um, so more I'm people not are tuned in too much to the national consciousness. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, I had to look up the word ruminate, which means to think deeply. <laughs> That's clearly, right. I don't know. <laughs> we have been doing this podcast for, what, 28 hours now? Yeah, not straight, though. Okay, yeah, not straight. But Interestingly, uh, cows are ruminants. Are they? Yeah. Cause they, uh, so there's, there's a tie in there. I'm not sure. I think it's, it's a Latin thing, but um, like a sub- uh, a, not species, but like a, a division of animals called ruminants, and because they very deeply digest their food, uh, okay. I think that's I mean, where ruminate where comes from. Where are you going from. with this? Well, I think that's where ruminate comes from, right? When you think deeply on something, because right. cows have what seven stomachs, or I'm sure there's some I farmers out there who'd be like, "It's eight, you dummy!" Yeah. No, no, it's not a joke. Okay, just uh, very insightful. Uh, commentary that our uh, discriminating listeners have so come to expect. So our listeners can expect well-digested <laughs> concepts in this exactly. episode. Exactly. Okay. We will chew it and then digest it seven times. <laughs> and Mark has now had his Coke Zero <laughs> yeah, fully yeah. caffeinated. Yeah, feeling uh, feeling awake. 34 milligrams of caffeine. <laughs> um, okay, so we were chatting in we between might episodes. We give the government 34 milligrams of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> we need a lot more than that. Um, but we were chatting uh, between episodes a little bit, and uh, I brought up the Phillips curve, which uh, raised a whole bunch of uh, questions. Yeah, first of all, who is Philip? Well, he's dead. Okay. Okay. So, but he was curvy. Uh, he was, I don't think he was. I, I, I haven't seen a picture of him, but I have this picture of, um, uh, I'm just trying to pull it up here, but A.W. Phillips, he was an economist in the, uh, you know, like 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, 1940s, 50s, 60s. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he was around for a while, yeah. right? But uh, he was an economist. And I just have this picture of like a thin British fellow with uh, maybe nearsighted, balding. Yeah. You know, I don't know. He could have been a hunky guy, I suppose. But he was, um, he was an economist anyways. And he uh, wrote this paper about the relationship... And, and there is a point to this, if you're listening, okay? It's very long-winded, <laughs> but there's a point. Um, he wrote a paper about the Mark, correlation. How yeah. can there be a point on a curve? <laughs> right. There's Just multiple curve data just... points. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, he wrote a paper that correlated wage inflation and unemployment. And the theory was that, and maybe I should just Do share. people know what correlation means? Uh, if they don't, they can, you know what? Then they just don't listen to this podcast, okay. Brent. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Look it up. We've made a sweeping <laughs> assumption that our listeners know what correlation means. Yes. It means there's a relationship between. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've just put it up on the screen here if anybody's uh, watching. And if you're not, it's a lovely graph. And it's got a bit of a curve. So if you're at a skate park, this would be, you know, pretty uh, a pretty good. A half pipe. Yeah, is, yeah, the uh, the one half of the half pipe. So Quarter correlation pipe. is uh, between wage inflation and unemployment. So lower unemployment, and this is based on a study that he did for, um, I can't remember now, but a, a few years, uh, probably a few decades uh, in the UK. Yeah. And lower unemployment is, is associated with higher inflation. And then he saw that high unemployment was associated with lower inflation in general, yeah. not an exact correlation every single time. But basically, if you've got high inflation, high wage inflation, so his thing was wage inflation. So if wages are going up rapidly, 
His observation that was unemployment would be lower, which makes sense, right? Wages are going up. More people are going to be tempted to join the job market. Yeah, so I think it makes sense. We just kind of said a lot of words there really fast and quite big words that I feel like are just, whoa. Because if you say inflation, okay, that's a concept. I got to wrap my head around inflation first. And unemployment. So you're saying if inflation... So he, he, well, so he was talking about wage inflation. Wage inflation. So that's how much people earn. Yes. So we have taken this in the ensuing decades to just be a general uh, price inflation. So inflation yeah. of everything. But originally it was just about wages. Okay. And then you could say, well, that you extracted out. That has to do. If wages go up, then the price of everything is going up. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what were the big words again? So if <laughs> so if wage inflation, so yep. how much people make yep. is going up, yep. then what happens? Employment also goes up yeah. or unemployment goes down because okay. really he's measuring unemployment here. Yeah. Um, but that makes sense because if, you know, if wages are going up, yeah. I can make more money. I'd be tempted to get off the couch that I've maybe, you know, flipping or not and, um, (laughs) go get another, uh, go get a a job because I can make more money. Yeah. Right. And then inversely, or, you know, on the other hand, um, if wages are going down or wages are not going up as fast, maybe they're stagnant or they're just sitting at the same level, people may be less tempted to get jobs. Um, and they'll, they'll stay. Yeah. So higher unemployment, with uh, lower inflation, lower wage inflation, right? So wages go up, people work more, wages go down, or wages stay the same, people stay home more. Basic theory. So that has become, um, that's known as the Phillips curve. Yeah. Right? And this is a, a tenet of our modern economic system. You know, you add Keynes to that, right? Where like recessionary spending and then... Um, uh, saving in the good times, Keynes. paying off that spending. Keynes John Maynard is not Keynes, like a cane, it's it's no. a man. <laughs> Sorry, he had a yes. theory. <laughs> yeah, so it really helps if you've listened to the previous podcasts. <laughs> where, well, because we've talked about Keynes and Keynesian <laughs> economics. Yeah, um, and so that's K E Y N E S. If you're uh, if you're looking this up, if you're going to Google it. But anyways, so that's the Phillips curve. And it's important to understand because that is, again, one of the basic building blocks of our economic system. And so the Fed, the Federal Reserve in the United States and most uh, central banks now have uh, what's called the dual mandate. So their job is to deal with two things. Those two things are inflation and unemployment. Yeah. And, you know, so when I first heard that, I'm like, oh, that's kind of... Why did they pick those two things out of Somewhat all the things that they could yeah. them economic and exactly? But the are... reason is the Phillips curve and what has been taught in economic schools for um, for decades. Do we have the mandate that we can pull up? Or <laughs> uh, I don't know if I have it. I was reading it somewhere on, I think, from the St. Louis Fed. Dual mandate. Okay. So oh, you got it there? Uh, I don't know, but. No, you don't got it. <laughs> Yeah. Core inflation and unemployment. That's the mandate. All right. Yes. I just verified what Mark said. (laughs) Okay. He Googled it, so it must be true. (laughs) Yeah. This is chicagofed.org. Oh, the Chicago Fed. That's legit. Yeah. Super legit. Um, Anyways, where were we? Yeah. So that that is the, the mandate of the Federal Reserve Bank, is to deal with those two things in some way, shape, or form. So the idea is... The main tool that they have to do that is with um, is with interest rates and possibly um, inflationary, sorry, not inflationary spending, but um, money printing, we'll call it. Yeah. So they're trying to basically when you look at inflation, it's how fast prices go up um, or down. Yep. But they usually go up. Um, yep. And we talked about reasons why and we could talk about more reasons why because we like talking about the reasons why prices go up but um their mandate is price stability so they want to have the prices not go too high yep um but also 
still increase. Yeah, so you want to be in, I'm just kind of circling this on my screen with my mouse, but you want to be, you know, they have sort of a target of, of 2%. Yeah, it um, says 2% here. Inflation, I think, was the sort of the magic number. And then that is also, according to the Phillips curve here, I don't know if that's right, but 2-ish percent unemployment, something like that. Yeah. Um, so, so they, they specifically state in this uh, in their mandate here that they would be concerned if inflation were running persistently above or below the 2% mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. So See, I'm not just making So it not up. A, if it goes up, that's a bad thing or down, it's a bad thing. But if it persistently, if it stays there. Yeah for a, a duration of time, then, then they get worried. And that seems reasonable, right? We'll manage inflation, and then uh, you kind of, as long as the Phillips curve is, is in effect, then while you're managing inflation, you're also managing employment yeah. or unemployment. And you can do that you know, mainly through interest rate um, uh, manipulation. So yeah. either bringing interest rates up or down. And the idea is if you bring interest rates up, that kind of dampens economic growth. So that should lower inflation. Yeah. Uh, and it should also raise unemployment. Yeah. Less people yeah. have jobs because there's less, less economic activity going on. Exactly. And, uh, but um, their target, like it does say here in their, their mandate, that they have maximal, maximum sustainable employment. So they want people to be employed to the ma like sustainably. Yeah. Right? Um, the largest number of people. Yeah, and I think if you hit around 2% in the States, like don't quote me on the number, uh, but that is about maximal, right? Because the, the understanding is that there's a certain amount of people who will never work. Yeah. And, you know, if you were at 1% or 2% unemployment, um, that's like, that's really that's a really good number in uh, any sort yeah. of uh, the industrialized idea, the obvious, society. If you have more people working, you have a higher amount of production for that country, you have a higher GDP. Higher tax, tax base, exactly. And spend more. Uh -huh. <laughs> tax and spend, baby. Let's see where this is going. So that's all great in theory, right? And we can, maybe we can address that later, right? That 2% inflation, that's a good thing. And I, I've heard Jerome Powell talk. He's the uh, chairman of the federal, Let's U.S. Federal Reserve now. Bank. Okay, we can address it now if you want to go on another, <laughs> another wild tangent. Um, but basically as he said, like, you know, that 2%, that's a good number and we would be happy with that. And you've just said, right. And the, that's what they've targeted, right. Around 2% a year. So that means the, to, to them, that means the economy is growing at around 2% a year, or that's sort of the explanation, right. Which is like, that's, everybody should be happy with that, right. We want the economy to grow. And if it's growing like at a moderate pace, then that's good for everybody, isn't it? Isn't it, Brent? Uh, yes. Do you want to get a word in edgewise? Or? No, I think that's good. I like it when <laughs> the economy grows. Yeah, but the problem is, as we have outlined, and hopefully everybody gets this by now, if you've heard other episodes, inflation is just an increase in the money supply in a given country. That's all it is. So that means there's 2% more money in, a, in the economy in a given year. And since we know that our economy is debt-based, that our money system is debt-based, that means there's more debt. The only way that money is created is by debt, right? By issuing new debt. So yeah. that could be government uh, spending, like government has a deficit, and that increases um, the amount of money because when they have a deficit, that means they're paying for services with money they don't have. So they need to take on debt to pay for those services. So if you just think of like they're building a bridge or something, right? They'll borrow money to pay for that. And uh, that money that they've borrowed never existed before. It now exists, say it's a million dollars. That is a million new dollars in because the government has that power, right? Yeah. You or I can't do that, but the government has that ability. So they've created that. Well, sorry, we can do that um, differently. <laughs> but, you know, just speaking broadly, like the, the government can create brand new money uh, based on nothing to pay for something. Right. And that would inflate the money supply. And that's where inflation would come from. So and I, I said we can't do it, but we can by getting a mortgage or by getting yeah. a loan of some kind. When we get a loan, generally speaking, 
not like give me 20 bucks Brent. <laughs> but if I go to the bank and especially for a mortgage and get a mortgage for 500 grand, that is new money that did not exist in the economy before. And it is now added to the economy. And that would also drive inflation. So what's the issue with the Phillips curve? Because that sounds on the surface like a good mandate to have. It sounds like we obviously want to keep inflation low. Yep. Um, and you're saying it's impossible to kind of bring it to zero. Well, I'm saying inflation itself is bogus. That The whole idea that we need inflation, it's, it's nonsense because that yeah. means we're creating more debt. But we have a system, again, based on debt that can only sustain itself by issuing more debt. And that's not good. And that's why I say the, the whole inflation <laughs> thing is bogus. But All if, is if lost. you were <laughs> eventually, if you were to accept that at face value, that, you know, 2% is a good, stable thing. Great. The problem is the Phillips curve is broken. Right. Okay. Right? So it's that's no a longer a half problem. pipe. It's like just sort of flat. Okay. Which is no good for skateboarding. As, uh, <laughs> as you well know, Brent, <laughs> uh, it's not a half pipe anymore. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, <laughs> yeah, but people have noticed this, right? That there, we don't have that correlation anymore. Um, it's it's kind of kind of flat. And so I'll just bring this up. You know, here's a chart from, again, from uh, St. Louis Fed. Um, and we're looking at unemployment, and we're looking at uh, personal consumption, which isn't exactly inflation, but. It's not opposites, right? And the whole idea is uh, unemployment and inflation are opposites. Yeah. But what we have now where we are is we're in a situation where we have high unemployment and high inflation. And that shouldn't be according to the Phillips curve, right? Yeah. Which is the predominant economic theory that yeah. a lot of governments and organizations use. Yeah. <clears throat> and so what, what tools do we have or what tools does a central bank, whether it's Canada or the U.S., have to deal with that? Right. The interest rate thing. Well, if you increase interest rates, you dampen the economy, you increase unemployment, but you can kill inflation with it, presumably. So what we're seeing now is the central banks playing this game and trying to walk a fine line um, where it's already probably they've lost control. But where you've got high inflation that they're trying to keep down or trying to drop because people are starting to notice now. And now politicians are going get, get, to get involved because my grocery bill has gone up and we can share. You've got something from Zero Hedge there. Um, you know, everything's going up. Everything's getting more expensive. People are starting to notice. So they want to sort of deal with inflation. Um, but if they do that, they're going to increase unemployment, according to the methodology of the Phillips curve. Whether or not that happens, I don't know. But the point is the system is kind of broken and the way they deal with it is broken. So what do you do, right? Yeah, they're in a bit of a pickle. A pickle indeed. Yeah, and pickles have gone up in price, so that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you know what? We, uh, at my house, we like a good pickle. <laughs> we certainly do. So, I don't know if everyone's thoroughly confused uh, now, but why don't we just completely pivot over to inflation and necessities? Um, well, I think that's a good sort of background yeah. for you know, interest rate hikes and like, why are they doing this? Right. Yeah. This is, this is why they have this that the mandate. Framework. They yeah. have the mandate to, um, lower inflation down to a target. They have the mandate to, um, play around with, uh, unemployment and employment, right? The yep. goal is to have, uh, a highest, the highest sustainable possible rate of employment, right? So everyone's gainfully employed in the country producing. Yep. Um, and that sounds logical, right? Like you want to yeah. have that, you want to have, um, the interest rate um, being stable so that the economy is kind of stimulated but not overstimulated. So it's just, yeah, it's just a big game. <laughs> and when the curve goes sideways and doesn't work, then everyone's left scratching their heads. But um, one thing you mentioned was the uh, inflation in um, necessities, so in things that people need. Yep. Um, because the inflation um, reported, inflation by the government, is... Uh, we talked about this before. It's a basket of goods, right? They yeah. hand select a number of different things. Um, and they always give you this statistic that um, 
It almost seems like this is the number it is in all of Canada or all the U.S. It's yeah, that's right. Whatever percent, right? And it just went up this month. Okay, so that's the new number for everybody in this country is this is the inflation. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you start breaking it down, you can really find out that um, inflation is, well, we talked about this before, different for everybody. Yep. Um, but then the inflation in the things that people actually need is... Uh, even more different than uh, the things that, you know, just you might not buy once a year, maybe you buy it once every 10 years, right? Yeah. So uh, what are those things? Well, those things are, um, you know, food, fuel, um, for your car, right? Shelter, um, all of these costs. So I just have uh, a few statistics here that we pulled up. Um, so just in the last three years, so from 2019, to uh i think the end of, to, to 2023 um there's a 30 percent increase in food costs for the average american yeah so you just take that alone like everybody needs food every single day yep um unless you're fasting right yeah so you you need food and in three years four years your your price goes up 30 percent yeah and you made the comment before that like prices once they go up they don't really come down right no we gotta we gotta beat that dead horse a little bit more too. <laughs> but let's get get through this point. yeah we'll so the other one too is gas so gasoline uh it was around it, this is u.s data so it's 2.5 uh per gallon so two dollars fifty a gallon yeah. and now it's 380 a gallon so yep. that's in three years um so a significant jump there housing is a big one so it's 1450 a month to rent for the average uh, family, single family home rental uh, in 2019, and now it's 2,000, somewhere around 2,000. So, and the cost of homes too has gone from uh, median cost of a home being 320 in 2020, and now it's 416. So, yeah. um, huge percentage wise, like if you sum that all up, the things that people need uh, is around 25 to 30 percent. Yeah. So the bottom line of all of this is that basically, and this is American data, which is really similar to Canadian, but it's, it gives you a good idea of where things are at. Yep. Um, the average person, if they want to maintain their standard of living, would have to make 25 to 30% more from three years ago. So if you ask yourself, like, has my job paid me 25 to 30% more? um over the last three years and if the answer is no then your standard of living if you're especially if you're average kind of category um you're suffering or it has it's dropped it's declined yeah and so you can make the argument i guess that you know the price of houses went up like i don't care i have a house yeah it, that didn't cost me any more right yeah. and maybe there's incremental uh, growth in utility bills and stuff. Um, and even renting, I guess, right. As long as you're, um, in a rent protected area, your rent won't have gone up unless yeah. you need to move. So a, not everybody's in a rent protected area. So yeah. that rent would have gone up for a lot of people. Um, and then yeah, B, if you're in a house, maybe that doesn't make a difference to you. But yeah. it does limit your ability to move. To move. That's maybe. a big thing we see in renters, right? Especially in Ontario, where we do have rent controls. Yeah. And people aren't moving as frequently because, for a large reason, I think, for um, the fact that rent is just simply double if I were to move. Right? Yeah. To get the same place. Yeah. So that's kind of the statistics we're looking at here. Is it's gone up thirty percent? I mean, in the states, the average um, yep. over the last three years. Um, if you're rent protected, you might not see that, but if you were to move, that would be the increased cost. Yeah. And, yeah. and that yeah. basically translates because people don't have 30% more in their wages. So that would just translate no. to 30% less standard of living. No, even if you have like a cost of living allowance or you're on some kind of grid, right? You gotta get one of those allowances. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Um, Right, you have one of those jobs that has a grid and, and you have uh, uh, increased wages every yeah. year. Like that's, you know, might be 2 3 4% if you're lucky. Yeah. It's certainly nowhere near 30% cumulative over three years, right? 
Like nobody, yeah. nobody's getting that. Um, you know, other than people who have the ability to increase their income some way yeah. or, or another. And one other interesting point. So like who wins here? People who own homes, right? Like maybe they don't see that right away. And we just finished rich dad, poor dad. And he said, your home is not an asset. <laughs> um, but if you're sitting, you know, and it's not an asset, but if you, if you own one of those if homes that has gone you. up 30%, yeah, it doesn't pay you, uh, but it's still worth more. Yeah. So that is, that's in terms that's of something. the price. Yeah. In terms of the, uh, the actual price. Yeah. Um, so that's crazy. 25 to 30%. And that's just for average. That depends yeah. on, and that's in the U.S. I, in the I US. feel like in Canada that's worse when it comes to the shelter Especially component. Especially in pockets, right? In certain areas uh, of, like I'm thinking the GTA where we yeah. are, like uh, house prices have gone up considerably. Yeah. They've come down as well, but uh, overall since 2019. They're still up. Uh, significantly up. Excuse so me. you're buying houses for 450 or, um, you know, around that. Yep. in our market and now they're probably 650 to 750 um, yeah. and they may be peaked at 850 so in in three years yeah yeah and the problem with that is if you're a person who's shopping for a home yeah right or you <laughs> i don't know you're following dave ramsey's plan and you're just going to buy your home in all cash yeah um like not going to happen right because it, we're talking percentages, but the numbers that you just listed, that's like a 200, at least a $200,000 difference in the price of a home. So yeah. even if, you know, your wages went up 30%, that probably doesn't, unless you're, I don't know what you're doing, but um, you're not, that's not another 200 grand over three years. No. Right? So let's, no way. So inflation, let's say it's 3%. Yep. What does that actually mean? Because... Does that mean that in a year from now, the things that I want are going to be 3% more expensive? Yeah. If you break it down sort of simplistically. Yeah. So, um, that, that could be, I don't know. Let's say, a nice, but if inflation itself goes from 3% down to 2%, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that things got cheaper. No. And we've made this point before, but I think it bears repeating, right? Inflation um, is cumulative, I guess, or inflation sticks around. So if I have, uh, this, you know, a steak that I want to buy, we talk about steak a lot, but let's say that steak is $10 and inflation is 3%. That means it's going to go up 30 cents, right? Over in the a year in, in the course of a year. But if inflation, if you see in the news this is what I'm kind of getting at. Yep. Like if you see in the news, inflation is down. That means that prices still are going up. They're just yeah. going up less quickly. Yeah. Inflation is uh, like a speedometer. And if it's at zero, then you're not moving forward. Yeah. Zero is, yeah. Zero is like stagnant, right? So yeah. if you're going 100 miles or 100 kilometers an hour, um, right? So that would be 100, whatever you want to call it, 100%. Uh, and then I back it off to 70 kilometers per hour. Well, I'm still moving forward. I'm still going further away from that starting point. Yeah. Just not as quickly. Yeah. But I'm still further. So if, so if actually... I have to walk back, every kilometer per hour that I'm driving <laughs> is further that I got to walk back to that starting point. So bring it back to prices. If you <laughs> Bring it back to food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, bring it back to that steak. So if my steak goes up... <laughs> Um, you know, 3% in a year. Now it's $10 and 30 cents. And then inflation drops to 2% the next year. The stake still goes up. The stake still goes up in price is 2% of that $10 and 30 cents. I don't know what that is exactly, but that's probably like 25 cents or something, yeah. maybe 23 cents. So now year two, that stake costs me $10 and 53 cents or something like that. Um, so it's not because I think people have this expectation when they see, oh, inflation has dropped. That means prices have dropped. No, that means the rate of growth has dropped. But prices are, if inflation's not 0%, yeah. it's still, prices are still going up. And they are going to stay that way as well. So right? unless you actually see 
the word deflation. Yeah. I don't know if we really talked about that concept. We can talk about that another time. But if you see deflation, that means the prices, seen going, it. <laughs> yeah, the prices are going down. Yeah. And that's something completely out of, but in relation to what we just talked about with the, uh, the federal reserve, their mandate is yeah. to have 2%. It's not to have zero. Nope. It's not to have negative. Nope. Right. Negative would be great. Maybe they should make their mandate negative 2%. Deflation is usually, um, usually what's the word I'm looking for? Usually it's a bad word, right? In, if you're talking about modern, uh, monetary theory, um, get out of my shot, Brent. <laughs> Where are we here? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, folks. Camera issues. Um, Deflation is normally associated with some kind of bad thing happening, right? Which is, you know, that we'll do a separate... Like your attitude has been deflated. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, economically, if there's deflation, that usually is ind indicative of some kind of problem. Um, but only because we have this framework of we need inflation, right? That's not actually true. So, um, but yeah, if you don't see deflation, prices are still going up. And as long as your wages are going up in lockstep with that inflation, then technically everything is okay, right? Now, we know it's not okay because inflation means there's more debt entering the system. And somebody's got to pay the interest, like got to pay that debt and pay the interest on that debt. Um, and that's happening beside, behind the scenes. So, you know, you've talked about some listeners who, um, you know, I've listened are starting to listen to the podcast or, or just learning about some of this stuff. But you know, they're just like regular folks. They got a regular job. They're just doing their thing, raising family, whatever. And, and then like, what well, I got to learn about all this stuff now. Like, this is nonsense. <laughs> Why can't I just go do my thing? But then when you look at the last three years, prices have gone up. That's not fair. 30%. It doesn't no, seem not, fair, right? No, it's not fair to that person who's just, Minding their own business. You did everything. Doing a good said. job. Contributing to society. Yeah. You went right? to university. You studied hard. You got a good job. Just like we talked about with Rich Dad. <laughs> yep. You did all the right things, but you... You're still you're getting losing, punished. Yeah. You're losing purchasing power. Um, and if you are unaware of that, I think it can blindside... Like, especially if somebody's... Let's say they bought a house. Yep. And they're just... They, they may notice groceries and gas are up, but it's not a real pinch. Maybe they're fixed in with their mortgage rate. And then what happens when the mortgage rate all of a sudden comes due and they're like, Ooh, yeah. is this the real cost of stuff? And then, um, what happens if they have to sell their house and move somewhere else? And then, Oh, they need to like pay this much for a house. Right. Like yeah. the, the reality comes, Whoa, hits you in the face. Yeah, and I mean, you and I have been seeing that with uh, our clients, investors, who a lot of them have been on adjustable rate mortgage, or sorry, variable, that's what we call it in Canada, adjustable rate mortgage in the States. Um, and they're, yeah, they're, their rates have gone up like ridiculously, right? But it's going to affect uh, most Canadians in the next year or two, right? Most mortgage terms, I think, are 5% max. So if you're on a fixed mortgage, so that's, again, a difference between here and the States, where the States you would lock in for 30 years. You mean five years, not 5%. Oh, sorry, I say 5%? Yeah. Five years, yeah. yeah. A five-year term. Um, again, whereas in the States, you might be a 30-year term, so less effect there. But here, five years. So that means, you know, if, you're, if you renewed in 2019, you're good till 2024, if you locked in at, at a low rate, right? And then, you know, you go on from there. But anybody from 2022 onwards, we've seen the rates start to climb from there quite a bit. And if you were kind yeah. of making all your plans and your budget based on a 2 percent uh, mortgage rate, well, now they're up at six, seven percent for uh, for mortgages, right? And if you're, you know with B lenders, maybe even more. Um, yeah. Especially if we've seen like bond yields are just ripping lately. And I don't know if we've, I don't know, should we discuss that? What, <laughs> no. what determines fixed <laughs> rates versus variable rates, right? Bond yields generally determine fixed rates, whereas the uh, Bank of Canada overnight rate determines the variable rates. But the problem is they're both going up. 
Yeah. Right. And the bond yields is a separate, um, separate economic indicators. But point is, it's all going up. It's affecting everybody. And some people aren't feeling that pinch right now, maybe just in groceries and stuff. But as you said, when it's time for that mortgage to renew, who's going to be... Uh, yeah, so maybe a different angle. So like, what's really interesting is how uh, there's still a huge demand for housing. Yep. And we just talked about how like inflation goes up and that reduces the standard of living, right? You can't afford to pay for whatever it is that you need. Uh, because it's gone up, so you reduce your uh, the amount of consumption or yeah. the quality of the items that you buy, right? So instead of me buying whatever something fancy, I'm just going to sacrifice. Maybe we can make do with this instead, right? And you yeah. shop at the dollar store instead of at, you know, buying your cutlery from some fancier re- um, place or whatever, um, or you're eating at home all the time instead of going out for day. Like those kind of examples, right? Yeah. So you've reduced your standard of living, but when it comes to housing. Um, like in Canada, especially we have such an influx of people that we have, <laughs> we have this crazy demand. I just give an example because this past week we, we have a number of units listed on the marketplace and we're trying to uh, find tenants. Um, and when you, when you post something out there, um, you get just click responses on your ad and sometimes like you find the right algorithm and it works but we had over almost 7,000 clicks on a listing and we had to the point where we can't even load the Facebook messaging system <laughs> to respond to these people because like I don't even know why but it's just so many responses to yeah. this thing right and that doesn't happen every time but um, when it does happen it just like opens your eyes to all these people so I did maybe 15 showings yeah right in the span of two days and i mean i didn't let everybody come through the house we screened everybody first so i picked 15 out of the 200 people that responded i picked 15 like those numbers uh are not unheard of either like i've heard other investors saying the same thing where they have um you know 8 10 12 30 people show up um and it's just there's so much of demand for a place to live because it's a thing that you need, right? Yep. Um, and the price of it is correspondent to the market demand. Like the price, um, the price of the rent is is high. Yeah. Right. There's just that many people looking and supply and demand, and there's no houses. Okay. Well, the price goes up, and yeah, it's this vicious circle, right? Then inflation goes up, and then and it doesn't come back down, like we just said, right? Yep. Um, unless you have deflation, which is I guess people moving out of the country and population declines or they increase the supply of houses. Yeah. So it's a really interesting part of the market that we're in right now. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's going to go away. It's yeah. And it's starting to get more press as well. Just the immigration side of it, right? Where uh, the government is starting to maybe wake up to it a little see bit that this is a bit of a crisis yeah so now they're like oh okay what are we gonna do but they haven't <laughs> talked about dropping immigration well, they, numbers yeah. in general maybe the, the government does this. what's politically popular right they want to yeah. do um, what's going to get them elected so what's politically popular right now um well so they have talked about uh, maybe imposing quotas on foreign students okay coming in which is a significant chunk of the population increase um yeah what was it it's probably seven hundred thousand or something was that the latest number seven hundred thousand well it was 1.2 million was oh yeah that's right yeah i'm I'm thinking 2022 was probably four hundred thousand or something was uh was students like just ridiculous right and you know that's another part of the problem here you've got these colleges and universities recruiting like crazy and we've talked about this before but they recruit like crazy but they have no um no responsibility for housing any of these students yeah so we get massive numbers of international students looking for housing and interestingly i did see someone um posted a response like okay but if we cap that like, what are we going to do to our labor force? Yeah. Right? And I think this was someone in government. And the, and somebody else was like, oh, hold on a second. This is students we're talking about, not the workers. Like, yeah. But it was just that sort of acknowledgement that um, 
the we have a temporary foreign worker plan, which is different, but in in effect, the student program is also a temporary foreign worker plan because they've scrapped the number of hours that students um, are limited to as far as work. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just understood. This is a get into Canada program. Get an admission somewhere, come here, get a job, maybe complete your Pay degree, big maybe bucks not. For... Pay big bucks. <clears throat> well, it's just the cost of a visa to Canada now. Yeah. Is the cost of tuition. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so that's one of the things the government's throwing around is maybe capping a number on uh, on students, but they don't want to touch immigration, right? <clears throat> yeah. But that kind of shows that they're going to try and fix the housing uh, crisis by limiting the amount of people. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. I'm so um, cynical over the <laughs> the federal government lately, especially like around, I mean, that like budget is one thing, but around the whole housing crisis, right? We're seeing like in Hamilton, they're proposing that we, um, we build tiny houses in parks across uh, Hamilton just to house uh, homeless people. Yeah. Um, like all kinds of. Yeah, all kinds of uh, ideas are being thrown around because, like, yeah, it's a crisis. And jamming more people into <laughs> this place where uh, housing starts are dropping, right? Yeah. I just uh, was reading that the other housing day. Another major new, developer new was like, yeah, new construction. Another major developer is like, we're just stopping new construction in Ontario. And we're going to see what's happening with um, with interest rates and with the economy. So housing starts are plummeting and like you can't blame them because interest rates are so hard to predict and developers depend on financing. Um, how can you predict if you've got a five year project, right? You need some kind of certainty and there is no certainty right now. So they're just like, no, we're stopping and that doesn't make the problem any better. No, makes oh, it worse. You could man. say <laughs> Why is it always so, doomsday kind of? I know I, we're always uh, always preaching this fire and brimstone or whatever. But um, <laughs> I mean, what you know? What's a person to do? I guess we can recognize the problem, but what do you? I don't know. What do you suggest we do about it, Brent? Well, yeah, I think the first thing is to know about it. Yep. Um, and not not to be alarmist about these headlines too, because we can read the headlines and. Uh, in the economic section and go, oh, okay, the world's coming to an end. Well, it will come to an end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not by... We, uh, we don't know when. <laughs> not by human doing. Uh, yeah, but um, I think it's important to develop um, kind of your own investment thesis around this, right? Yeah. And not make decisions kind of in a vacuum, but analyze all of these trends from a high level and s like... Like you said, it's it's really volatile. Like things will go up and then they come down and then yeah. they're hard to predict. So that's why people aren't building houses, for example, or businesses aren't uh, building factories or certain businesses might see opportunity and they are, but most people are kind of like... If you're Volkswagen and the government gives you billions of dollars, yeah. Yeah, if you get grants. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we're both open to receiving grants. <laughs> yes. <for> anybody. <laughs> um, but if, you're, if you think volatility is in the future, then you're kind of, you might be tempted to just kind of freeze and not do anything. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think if you analyze, uh, kind of the overall situation and pull up some data and actually look at the numbers and historical trends. And, um, I think having an economical kind of background or training and, um, how to, I don't want to say predict the future, but how to analyze some of this stuff would help. But yep. um, even that aside, like looking at fundamentals for an area, and I'm talking specifically about real estate investing now, because um, that's obviously one way that we believe um, you can kind of use all of these forces to your advantage. Yeah. So um, really studying kind of, um, okay, if Canada is your market and you're in Canada, um, what, what factors impact the real estate market in your area? What factors impact uh, the real estate over a long period of time, mm -hmm. not just a two year window? Um, interest rates is a huge impact, but it also fluctuates quite a, but, quite a bit, right? Yeah. We've seen that. And I've heard it said like, usually it's like a stairs going up. So interest rates climb steadily over time and yeah. it doesn't usually just shoot straight up. I mean, we've had a big uh, increase lately, but 
when it comes down, it usually drops off a cliff yeah. uh, pretty quick. So um, we can see uh, the past and then we can say, okay, well, if interest rates have gone up and come down in the past, generally they've been trending down for the last 40 years. Um, why is that? And if that's so, what do I believe for the next 40 years? Like, is the trend going to be um, low? Is it going to be high? Mm-hmm. And why? And can you justify that with other data? Um, it takes a bit of thinking through. And this is why we kind of want to do this podcast too, because people um, don't necessarily have the time to do all this digging. Yeah. But it has a big impact on their life. Yeah. So it's kind of a frustrating situation to be in. And I feel the same way. Like, at my, I feel the same pain where you're, it's like, why am I reading these books and reading these articles and trying to talk to people about this and ask questions? Because, like, I feel like I should just get on with my life. Yeah. But you kind of. This kinda, is your life now, Brent. Yeah, you kind of can't. <laughs> now this is my life. Um, believe it or not. Ah, uh, so. Yeah. But yeah, if you don't, if you don't make decisions that um, financially, at least, right, that can um, kind of you know, say use these forces to your advantage. We always say that, but um, yeah, I just, you can't really work against them. That's that's the yeah. that's the idea, right? Like the forces are bigger; they're outside of your control. It's not like you're just going to stop inflation tomorrow and change it, or, or you're not going to call up. The Bank of Canada or the the Federal Reserve and say, "Can you lower the interest rate, please? My mortgage is a bit high. I just wanted to come down a little bit, yeah, and uh, then I can feed my kids steak again instead of just pizza. Nothing against pizza, yeah. And I did read uh, theory, but all those things are outside of your control. Yeah, I did uh, hear somebody had a theory that the last uh, rate pause. There's probably more rate hikes coming in Canada, but the last rate pause was specifically because of homeowner concerns in Canada. And that's sort of a, I can, I could buy that, I guess, right? They're just sort of acknowledging that homeowners are feeling the pain with interest rate increases and like mortgage, mortgages going up that much. Um, So yeah, that kind of makes sense, I guess. But I mean, the long term, right? Our thesis is invest in Southwestern Ontario um, in single family housing. And like, because of the, all these, all these long-term factors, immigration being one of them. And I don't think we could have predicted the amount of immigration that's coming now, Yeah. but it has been like a steady, a steady thing for the past, however many decades, right? Inflation was dr- helping to drive prices up and to, to, uh, drive scarcity in real estate. And that's just been exacerbated that much more. So with interest rates going up, um, yeah, that's making cash flow a lot harder. But I mean, I, I've also heard it, uh, investment uh, theories being compared, saying like if you would invest in your RSP for, you know, 200 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month every year for 40 years, um, you know, why not do that same thing with a house? where you may have periods where there's no cash flow. So it's like you're investing 200 or 400 or 500 bucks a month into that investment. But you know that in the long term, it's going to be worth more. Right. And that, okay, that kind of makes sense to me. Right. So, you know, we've talked about properties that were cash flowing very well uh, two years ago and now are not because of, um, because of interest rate hikes and mortgage rate hikes. But, at the end of it, if we if you look at all these things we're talking about, inflation, population growth, um, housing starts dropping, so just more sk- like just supply and demand, right? Those factors are still here in southern Ontario. So if you have a house now, probably not the time to sell it unless you absolutely have to, because there is a very good chance that in five years, that in ten years, it's going to be worth a lot more, mm-hmm. a lot, a lot more. Um, because of these factors that we've been discussing. So, you know, and that's, we talked about all these terrible things and, you know, what do you do? And the one example in the inflation was that median house price went up. Okay, so those, imagine if you had a couple of houses in that area. Yeah. Well, on paper now, anyways, you've just made so much more money than you could make working a regular job. Like way, way more. Without doing anything. Without doing a thing. And then chances are, unless you're in a rent-controlled area, your rent is also going up. 
And so, you know, you've got sort of the paper gains, the equity gains, but also cash flow gains. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it just comes back to that, uh, to investing in real estate and that, <laughs> the cash flow game, I guess, right? <laughs> like, what do you do? Um, so, you know, if you don't own property, you know, what can you do? Find ways to increase your income to offset that that inflation and try and get assets. Well, this is why we want to highlight it so much is because yeah. if you don't have a scarce asset that you own, what can you do? Like the yeah. options are uh, limited, but they're also decreasing, I would say, right? Like, Yeah, as, decrease your quality of life or increase your income, yeah. really. Yeah, but um, your options are becoming more and more limited every year that kind of goes by where these forces are coming to play yeah. more and more. Right. Yeah. Um, because like we mentioned off the top, like they compound upon themselves, right? Inflation going down from 10% down to 5% doesn't mean things get cheaper. That just means things don't get as expensive or <laughs> as, as quickly. quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you still have 10% the one year plus 5% the next year. Um, yeah. And yeah. So now you say decrease your standard of living. Like, you almost have to decrease your standard of living uh, beyond where you think, right? Like yeah. not just so that you can manage, but even more so that you can save in excess. Yeah. Right. So if you say you're renting for like 2000 a month um, and you know, you want to buy something, well maybe you got to rent for a thousand bucks a month and where is we're going to do that. Well, you might have to commute for two hours just to find a place for a thousand bucks a month. Or get roommates and yeah. share your space. Or yeah, make all other kinds of sacrifices. Yeah. But the idea is to do that for a limited period of time. Right. Um, and the same thing go like if you're not a young person in that situation, right. Maybe you do have a house. Um, but you know, you want to invest and in, you see the problem here and you're like, Oh, I want to buy another asset. Well, um, you might not have the bandwidth or the money set aside to do that, but you might have to take a sacrifice for the next five, 10 years for your family. Right? Like yeah. if you say, I already own a house for 10 years. Well, you know, how could I get into this because I don't have the money? Well, you could borrow from your house, yep. but you might even have to uh, decrease your standard of living. And that's a hard thing to hear. Right. But doing that now, um, while you're kind of, um, you know, well, you can, well, you can, um, no, you have to, but you can. Yeah, uh, exactly. And if you have a willingness to do that and I don't want to say suffer, but yeah, it's not pretty to decrease your standard of living, especially when your peers are like, you know, Hey, look at my new boat. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but yeah, do we need to hit that dead horse even harder? Or? <laughs> no, I think we, uh, I think we covered that. So, um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I thought we should talk about this because it's, you know, it's been in the news and um, just in gen inflation in general. Yeah, so now and people then, know all about the Phillips curve. Exactly. Um, Next time we're going to talk about the Phillips screwdriver. Oh, And right. then the Roberts, which is a far superior <laughs> screw and screwdriver, Canadian invented. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a separate trivia podcast. Uh, thanks for listening to this episode of the Two Stewards Show. And until next time. Steward your wealth wisely. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Two Stewards Show. If you like my voice better, click subscribe. And if you like my voice better, click share. If you like both, give us a five-star rating. To interact with the show, feel free to reach out at hello at twostewards.ca. We'll see you in the next episode. In the meantime, steward your wealth wisely.